The wedding plans are delayed. Everyone's in a state of crisis. Everyone's heart is breaking. At least Camilla's in, pa in pause. And um, then Harry says, other than feeling sorry for them, I couldn't help but thinking that some force in the universe, Mummy, was blocking rather than blessing their union. Maybe the universe delays what it disapproves of? <laughs> that is so dumb. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another episode of I'll Spare You the Details. And this is going to be a long video. Okay, so you're going to need to just get yourself a cup of tea, pour yourself a cup of coffee, get comfy, because we're going to be here for a little while. If you're like, I just can't take 50 minutes of Harry. Don't worry, I'll cut this up and tomorrow you can watch the clips. But if you are one of the faithful, one of the diehards, one of the people who really want to know what's going on in Spare, Sit back, because I'm about to tell you. And we're getting into some crazy stuff. We're getting into the marriage with Camilla. A lot of shade being thrown at Camilla. We're getting into his time at boot camp. We're getting into the unfortunate event with the Nazi costume. He also introduces us to Kate for the first time. Seems very positive about Kate. And then we we're talking about some injuries that he had during his time at boot camp. We're talking about more of that crazy campaign spin doctor. The crazy campaign spin doctor is at it again. Um, we are going to deal with the fact that there appears to be a spy in the ranks. Somebody is feeding information to the press. So, you know, for the last time we talked, he was being a little bit more interesting, just talking about various things he had done and his gap year was pretty interesting. But we are back now at more about all of Harry's inner tragedies and his emotional outbursts and his claims that the world is so devastatingly unfair. So if you could handle it, sit back. Okay. Um, let's take off this jacket. It's really cold here today. And as you can see, I'm not running a high dollar operation over here. And I just film these in my corner of the garden shed where I have my office space. And it's cold out here, y'all. It's real cold. I film these at four o'clock in the morning. And I don't want to run the space heater because then you can't hear what I'm saying. And, um, but I'm not dedicated to my craft, y'all, that I'm going to bring you this book. I'm going to bring you these chapters and... We're going to find out what in the world Harry's talking about. Okay. Um, but before we get into it, you know, I have to say my little spiel. Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. Uh, you're watching, but you're not subscribing. And I hate to call you out like that, you know. I hate to point it out, but you have watched seven videos already. Why are you lollygagging on the subscription? You know what to do. Like and comment and subscribe. Okay, come on. It's just common decency, okay, you guys? It's just common decency. So if you could just do what you know is right and not just consume, but also give back. Give back to the YouTube community by subscribing so that I can make more content. You're doing a good deed for society, okay? In fact, not just a good deed, but a great one. So, like, comment, and subscribe. Share with all your friends. You know the drill. Okay. I'll spare you the details. We have so much to get through. Where to begin? Where to begin? Okay. Um, let's begin with the wedding. The wedding has arrived for Camilla and Pa. Remember, William and Harry had gone to him and said, Pa, we don't mind if you are with her publicly, but... It just seems a shame for you to actually be with her in marriage. So if you could just hold off on that. And Paul said, I mean, he made, no, he, he made no promises. So they really had nothing to, like, they couldn't be like, oh, he's reneged. He didn't renege. He never said he was going to. So he's come to them and he's like, okay, we really want to get married. And he said, Harry writes that, 
Despite Willie and me urging him not to, Pa was going to go ahead. We pumped his hand, wished him well. No hard feelings. You don't have a right to have hard feelings. Don't pat yourself on the back for that. I mean, we recognized that he was finally going to be with the woman he loved, the woman he'd always loved. The woman fate might have intended for him in the first place. Whatever bitterness or sorrow we felt over the closing of another loop in Mummy's story, we understood that it was beside the point. Okay, how very grown up of him to come to these conclusions on his big boy self. Um, but then it's like, okay, well, then there's the drama of where are we going to get married? Because Pa and Camilla aren't allowed to get married in the church because she is a divorcee. So um, they can't get married in the Church of England. So they have to have a civil ceremony. And they thought about getting married at Windsor Castle. But the problem with that is that then in order for them to get married there, then the castle had to be, um, oh, what, how do they, licensed for civil ceremonies. And if you do that, then every little bit of riffraff who wants to have their little sad sack wedding gets to come up to Windsor Castle and, you know, abuse the place for their own pleasure. So can't do that. That's what he says. He says that, you know, if, if you license it for civil weddings, then everyone in Britain would be allowed to have their civil wedding there. So no one wanted that. Okay, well, God forbid the taxpayers have a little something of their own, but whatever. And then, uh, so they decide to, they, they finally settle it. The wedding is all planned. Everything is hunky-dory. They're going to get married. Ding-dong the wedding bells. Except for the Pope dies. Now, Harry couldn't see what that had to do with his dad. Poor boy. Can't ever put two and two together. Does he not understand his fame is really important in the world of politics? Anyway, he says, Pope, the Pope's dead, but what's that got to do with Pa? And as it turned out, Pa and Camilla couldn't, this, okay. Listen to this passage very carefully. Harry describes things this way. You know, everything Harry says sounds to me like the ramblings of a child who's overheard the grown-ups talking. Like he's put two and two together, but in his broken way, and he's come up with six. He says that the Pope died, and bewildered I asked Willie, what's the Pope got to do with Pa? Loads, it turned out. Pa and Camilla didn't want to get married on the same day the Pope was being laid to rest. Bad karma. Less press. More to the point, Granny wanted Pa to represent her at the funeral. Okay, the only thing that that is true in that entire statement is the fact that they couldn't get married because Pa has to go to the funeral. Granny's elderly. She can't, she, I mean, she's going to have to start, she can't just be traveling all over the world. So Pa needs to go. And being the heir to the throne, that would be an appropriate thing for him to do. What is this little bit about they didn't want to get married on the same day as Pope died because they'd get less press? <laughs> That's his game. He's the one that's always running around. Oh, stupid nose run. He's the one that's always running around, obsessed with the press. And what are they saying about him? He wants press as much as the next person. He just always wants it to be good. But what is he saying about the fact that, you know, they, weren't, they didn't want to get married on that day because then they'd have to share the press with the fact that the Pope had passed away? Seems to me like Pa, who just wants to get married to this woman that he's loved his whole life, wouldn't care who knew about it. He just wants it done. Harry... Why are you so cynical? Okay, so the wedding plans are delayed. Everyone's in a state of crisis. Everyone's heart is breaking, at least Camilla's in, pa in pause. And um, then Harry says, other than feeling sorry for them, I couldn't help but thinking that some force in the universe, Mummy, was blocking rather than blessing their union. Maybe the universe delays what it disapproves of? <laughs> that is so dumb. That's so dumb. You just finished saying that you were happy for them and that you had reached sort of these like new heights of understanding. And now you're saying, oh, mummy is coming and blocking their union. Is mummy the universe? Is mummy God? What are you talking about? The universe, mummy, all of this. <sighs> Poor guy. He's so confused. So anyway, the wedding takes place. He says he kept his head bowed, his eyes on the floor, just like at Mummy's funeral. It's always about Mummy's funeral. And he said he, like, you know, the whole time kept thinking, good for you, Pa, good for you. But also goodbye. I couldn't help thinking that this is going to take Pa away from me. Well, did you already just say that Pa was never, was never the dad that you wanted him to be? That he was always aloof? He was always um, disconnected from you emotionally? You've already made the point that Pa is not who he should have been your whole life. You've already said 
Pa was never around. Pa was never around. Pa was never around. The best he could do is, you know, leave a letter on my pillow after supper. And now you're going to tell me that Camilla is going to get in the way of all this? Please, give me a break. Is Paul there for you or is he not there for you? And if he's not there for you, what is the difference of Camilla entering the picture? You guys, we have so much more to go. I cannot just scrap over every word he says. But I have to tell you, I mean, I underlined so, many, so much in this section. There's just so much that doesn't make sense. Um, but then he says this business. Y'all sit tight for this. He says, um, he had complex feelings about this whole thing. Complex feelings about gaining a step parent who I believe had recently sacrificed me to her personal PR altar. Now the campaign's been doctor again. But I saw Pa smile. It's hard to argue with that. And hard is still to deny the cause. Pamela, I wanted so many things. But I was surprised to discover at their wedding that one of the things I wanted most still was for my father to be happy. I sure, I'm sure it did surprise you that you could feel for somebody for once for their happiness rather than for yours. It's funny that that would surprise him. They would care about his father's happiness. Um, and then he says this. I mean, it's just like cutting, cutting jab. It's like he just is over there with a dull knife hacking away at the people that he loves. His dad loves Camilla. And Camilla is his stepmother. She's in the family. And she's done a lot to gain the approval of the British public. She's worked tirelessly. And for him, at this late date, to write all this about Camilla, I mean, this would be one thing if this is what he wrote before he'd ever seen how she was in the role and in the position that she has, if he wanted to say these things. But he knows who she is now. And there doesn't seem to be any... As he's writing this book, it doesn't seem like he has any reflections about... He never says anything like, at the time I felt this way, and I'm so pleased to see that my fears never were realized. All, all of my uh, suspicions came to naught. But no, he doesn't ever say anything like that. He says that he wants his father to be happy. And in a funny way, I even wanted Camilla to be happy. Maybe she'd be less dangerous if she was happy. <laughs> I mean, what? Why would you say that about somebody? He never had any evidence that she was feeding things to the press, ever. Never once has he said, then I talked to so-and-so who said, I saw Camilla on the phone. Never did he like listen to a recording of Camilla feeding things to the campaign spin doctor. But still on and on and on. It's Camilla, it's Camilla, it's Camilla. Then he says, there are published reports that Willie and I snuck out of the church and, and hung just married signs in the car. I don't think so. I might have hung a sign, be happy, if I thought of it at the time. <laughs> More trash where the editor could have been like, slash, slash, slash. You don't know if you did it? You don't think so? Reports say you don't know? I mean, he really should have le read less about himself because he's so mixed up in what really happened in his life. Somebody said this. I don't know. I don't know if I did that. I mean, there was a story written, but, 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 but I don't know. Maybe if you did fewer drugs, drink less whiskey, you might know what was happening in your own life. Then he says that he just wanted everybody to be happy. And it's like, he's like, damn, I'd like all of us to be happy. Okay, well then be happy. Choose to be happy. You are miserable because you're constantly looking for all the reasons and the whole world has slighted you time and time and time again. Okay, we gotta pick up the pace here. <laughs> we just can't go over a stupid word he says because if we did that, we'd be here for eternity and beyond. Um, okay, now he's talking about how he had to delay his entrance into Sanders because he had an injury, he says. Now, he says that the press completely maligned him in this entire situation because they said that he'd been up to no good. And they said that he was a coward and that there was all these sort of um, nefarious reasons why he had not entered Sanders at proper time. And he's here to set the record straight. He says that the... Royal family has always maintained ties with the military and they do all these sorts of like exercises and things with the military. I'm not entirely sure why they would be doing it. He writes and he says that mommy had taken he and William to this exercise, this military exercise, to this quote unquote killing house in um, Herefordshire. And he says that the three of them were put into a room and told not to move. And then the room went dark and then a squad kicked in the door and there were flashbangs going off and it was supposed to scare them really bad. 
um, because it was supposed to teach them how to respond if they were ever in a position uh, in which their life was in danger. Okay, so mommy took them to that little fun time. And throughout his life, he'd always done these exercises with the military. Um, and when he got older, he was like, it was less of him being shown what the military would do for him if he were in a crisis and need to be rescued and more like him involved in the actual military exercise. So on one of these little fun times, um, he and William went together and they were climbing up and down these ladders and there was paintball guns involved. And one at one point he was scuttling down in spite of metal stairs. Somebody cut the lights, he said, to make it seem more exciting and thrilling. And at that point he stumbled down the stairs and he skipped the four last steps of the staircase, landed on his left knee. Oh, this is so gross. Which was Im immediately impaled on a fixed bolt sticking out of the floor. Mm -mm, that is so nasty. Oh, ooh, your knees. Oh, like I'm, I, I have to grab my knees. Ooh, just the thought of it. Ooh, I can't, I can't, I can't. Okay, so as you can imagine, he's wounded desperately. And he said that he tried to stand up and finish the drill, but at the end of the exercise, when they jumped into the water, he found his leg wasn't working. And when he got out of his wetsuit and like peeled off all his clothes, his knee was just gushing blood. As you can imagine, since it was just impaled by a bolt. Um, he says, Willie looked down and turned pale. I guess Willie can't stand the sight of blood or the fact that your knee is grossly, disgustingly torn apart. The paramedics were there within minutes. I should hope so. I'm sure they were on standby. Um, and then he says that the reporters... Okay, so of course he can't enter the army at this point. He's wounded. Grievously wounded. And he says that the palace comms team told the, the rabid press that Prince Harry had injured his knee playing polo. Oh no. He'd injured his knee playing rub rugby. Okay. I don't understand why they would lie about that. I mean, maybe they don't want anybody to know. Apparently it was sort of hush-hush that they would play these, you know, games with the military and that the princes would be involved. Okay. I mean, I think we can assume that something like that was probably going on. Why wouldn't they? I mean, they got nothing else to do between their charities. And so um, the press decides that he didn't hurt his knee playing rugby. Probably didn't even hurt his knee at all. He's probably just super, super, super cowardly. That's what his problem is. So he's mad. He's mad that they are taking, he says that they're taking their revenge on him because they knew that the lie, or they knew the story about his rugby injury wasn't real. And so he says in order to get back at him for being told a false story, they just decided to up the ante and say that he was a coward. Like they've got time for that. I mean, what? How does he think the world works? That's not how it works. They're not like over here printing lies to get back at you because they don't think that they got something close enough to the truth. So then they just make up a bigger lie. I'm not saying they're not over there fabricating the truth, but that, I don't think that's their motivation. <laughs> Please. Okay, now we get to the part of the infamous Nazi uniform. Oh, Lord. Um, okay. This entire passage is so frustrating to me because it's on the one hand he wants to say it wasn't my fault I just didn't know what to wear I just didn't know what to wear there's a billion uniforms in the world there's a billion outfits you could have worn so many costumes to choose from and you choose to wear a Nazi uniform and then you get you buy a mustache to wear and then you claim that the ends of the mustache were too long so then you you trim them and then it looked like a Hitler mustache I mean, it's not like you can make a Hitler mustache by mistake. It's a pretty specific look on that mustache. You had to do that purposely. So he says that how what happened was Willie had, was having a birthday party. It was a costume party, or as they say, a, a fancy dress party. And he said that it was it had a cringy theme. Those were these are the words in his book. It had a cringy theme of natives and colonials and guess we're required to dress accordingly okay well if you don't if you think it's that cringy then don't go you don't have to go to the party just don't go if you think it's so lame don't go 
But of course he goes. And, okay, bear in mind this entire time, the theme is natives and colonials. Okay, natives and colonials. All right. So he's got to have a costume. How did a Nazi uniform fit into that theme? A Nazi is neither a native or a colonial. So already you're just like, okay, but you had to get dressed up. You had to, to wear something in this theme. You would Nazi uniform? That doesn't, I, I don't even, I can't even be like, well, I mean, the theme was the thing that drove you into the wilderness of bad ideas. It was the theme's fault. No, it was your fault. You, didn't, you weren't even dressing with the theme. So Willie apparently was dressed as some kind of a leopard or something like that. And um, some sort of feline outfit, some skin tight leotard. And it had a bouncy tail and they all thought it was really funny. This is also where he introduces us to Kate for the first time. He says that um, Kate, he describes her as this. His new girlfriend, Kate, was carefree, sweet, kind. She'd done a gap year in Florence. She knew about photography and art and clothes. She loved clothes. That seems like a retroactive statement. I mean, you look at pictures of Kate when she was, when we first came, when she first came on the scene. She always looked cute, as could be. But, I mean, it didn't, she was wearing fairly normal things. I mean, she wasn't dressing, she wasn't dressing like she dresses now. I mean, I mean, clearly now people are making her clothes for her. Um, obviously they should. She's a fantastic figure. Who wouldn't want to dress that? And anyway, so I just, that doesn't seem like something a man would say. Once again, the insertion of the Markle, but who knows? Um, anyway, he says that her name was Kate. She was a lot of fun and he loved to make her laugh. That's always his thing. He's the clown. Conrad loved to make her laugh. And he said that he, um, he imagined how, like how fun life would be if he could, you know, bring Chels into it and he and Chels and, and Willie and Kate could all be double dating. It was just going to be this fab foursome, the original fab four. And, you know, it just, it all seemed like sunny good times to him. Well, this picking up the uniform sort of all played into that. Like he wanted to make them laugh. He especially wanted to make Kate laugh. And as he was trying to choose his costume, he couldn't figure out what he wanted to wear. Somebody said, oh, well, you should go to this shop. They've got like a lot of costumes. Go there. So as he's describing the, the costume shop, he describes it in these like real shady sort of, uh, sort of like this underbelly of the costume world. He goes in and it smells moldy and it smells kind of like dirty laundry. And um, anyway, he's sifting through the clothes on the, these CD racks. And there's, in this entire store, there's only two things that would have been fitting. A British pilot's uniform and a sand-colored Nazi uniform. Which one should I choose as a prince? A prince of England, which one should I choose? Anyway, so he's standing there at the racks. He's got his two choices. The British pilot's uniform, <laughs> hello, and the Nazi uniform. And he says that he phones Kate and Willie and asks them what they think. And they're like, oh yeah, <laughs> get the Nazi uniform. That's hilarious. And they howled and they hooted and they said it was even better than Willie's leotard. It was good. So funny. It's just so funny. Oh my gosh. Yeah, get that one. We're just rolling over here. So because he can't ever make any of his own decisions, this is what he does. But you guys... Listen to what he says a second before he tells us that they are the ones that told him to get it. He says that he went to the costume shop and it's a bit blurry, but that this is how he, this is how he recalls it going, even though it's all a bit blurry. So already it's like, okay, well, how convenient for you. So because they told him to do it, then he had to do it. Okay, well, Eve's been using that story since the beginning of time, but no one's forgiving her for feasting with the snake. So that's not going to work for you either, Harry. Um, he says that he got, he got the costume, like it was like a shirt. He put, he added it with some cargo trousers. He got a mustache. He trimmed the ends and made it into a proper Hitler mustache. He says that he made it into a proper Hitler mustache. 
Um, and then they go to this party, and it was all, you know, it was a lot of fun, everybody had a great time, blah, 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 blah. But somebody at the party, some transgressor, had taken some photos and then sold them to the press, and then that was all anybody could talk about for days and days and days. And he felt super humiliated, horrified. Like he just wanted to die. He was so embarrassed that he had done this. And he said that he felt that he was being engulfed. Um, that there were moments over the course of the next several weeks and months that he thought he would die of the shame. And he says that everyone wanted to know what could he be thinking. And the simplest answer was he wasn't thinking. He didn't think it would be bad at all. Now, on the one hand, I want to say this. Pretty bad choice there when you had a British pilot's uniform. I mean, why would, why would you just go with the safer option, knowing that people will see you? If you say that you can never have a moment's peace, that everybody's always looking at you, that the press is always hounding you, that there's always somebody looking to spin you under the bus, why would you put yourself in a situation where somebody could ever mock you and claim that you had evil intentions and bad motivations and that you're a bad actor. Why would you do that? You know they're gonna say ugly things about you. Why give them the opportunity to do it? At this late stage of your life, I mean, here you are, you, you're finished with, with Eaton, you are about to go into the military, you've had your gap year, like you've seen some of the world, you've experienced some of the world. So why are you still making these boneheaded decisions? With that being said, he was still young. And I don't think that he, like we've said before in other videos, he's just really impulsive. If he thinks he's going to get a laugh, he's going to do it and then pay the consequences later. And he thought this was going to be really funny, like real, sort of like edgy funny, you know? But anyway, um, Willie was sympathetic, but I mean, what is there to say? Then he phoned Pa. He says to his surprise, Pa was very serene. And he says, at first I was suspicious. I thought maybe he was seeing my crisis as another opportunity to bolster his PR. Go back over to that campaign spin doctor. Well, the campaign spin doctor was not the reason that Paul was kind. Paul was kind because he could imagine where his son was and that he himself had had many bouts of embarrassment in the press before. We all know about the leaked tapes. We all know about all the stories that people have told about Prince Charles in the past, now King Charles. And he knew what it felt like to be humiliated by the press for a poor decision that was caught. And so, of course, you could speak about it with a lot of empathy and sympathy. And so Harry goes on for quite a long time talking about how much he appreciated his father's gentle kindness and understanding and, and assurances that this could be made right. And he just had to ride the storm. But it was going to be all right. Well, then he says this line that I'm like, oh, just get a grip. He says that Pa promised him that the fury about this would blow over. The shame would fade. I loved him for that promise, even though, or maybe because I knew it to be false. The shame would never fade, nor should it. <sighs> Give me a blessed break in this day. Give me, <sighs> somebody revive me. I'm so sick of this line. You should be ashamed and you should be ashamed forever. Why? Because you did something stupid when you were a kid? You can say, that was so foolish of me. I should never have aligned myself, even in joke, with something that has such a foul taint to it. I should never have put that on. I should never put the mustache on. I look like a fool. I was a fool. I was 19 years old or however old he was. But to go on and on and on and be like, I'll never get over the shame and I never should. Ridiculous. I is such a ridiculous modern... <clears throat> as, such a ridiculous modern idea of how to get through life. If you lived with the weight of every dumb thing you'd ever done, you'd never get up at the end of the day. Okay, so, um, but he has to pay for his crimes in some way. So his father arranges him for him to go and see a very um, eminent scholar. Um, and he went to go see the chief rabbi of Britain. And this individual, who he does not name, which it seems like he might have, um, this individual was not easy on him. He, he did point out the folly of the decision, but he also reminded him, and he said, he urged me not to be devastated by my mistake, but instead, but instead to be motivated. He spoke to me with the quality 
one often encounters in truly wise people, forgiveness. And he assured me that people do stupid things, say stupid things, but it doesn't need to be their intrinsic nature. I was showing my true nature, he said, by seeking to atone and seeking absolution. Okay, so there's a bit of wisdom for us, isn't there? Okay, but he literally just said one page over that he felt terrible shame and he should never get over it. So how much was he listening to the chief rabbi? He should have sat at that man's feet for the rest of his life and maybe he could have made something of himself. Um, okay, so he recognizes that forgiveness is the some of the highest wisdom that one can attain and yet he's over here refusing to forgive himself so i guess he's traded the highest wisdom for a bunch of woke nonsense it says be sorry about your be sorry about your sins forever never more you'll never be able to atone for them but at least you know that you are a piece of garbage and should always be sorry that you were ever created there's a lot of hope there you won't find it you won't be able to pick it out but we promise that's the best way to live okay now we get into a bit where he has decided he's got to figure out what in the world happened to mummy. I mean, where in the world is that woman? Here I am year after year after year waiting for her. She sent me foxes. She sent me leopards, but she ain't here yet. Maybe she really did die. Hmm. There's an uncomfortable supposition. Well, I'll go talk to my new guy, my new bodyguard, who is supposed to be the best guy in the entire British realm. I'll go to that guy. His wisdom is beyond is beyond measure. Apparently, he'd gotten this new bodyguard, this new private secretary. Oh, I see, he's a private secretary. Sorry, he's like sort of like replacing Marco. This guy's name was Jamie Lowther Pinkerton, but they called him JLP. He he describes JLP as being a uh, product of Britain's finest military training, and. He says that when British officials decided to launch a massive offensive against the Colombian drug cartel, they chose JLP to lead it. Also, this individual had given um, the actor Ewan McGregor some sort of assistance in figuring out how to survive his motorbike trip through Mongolia, Siberia, and Ukraine. So this guy is, you know, he's got some extensive knowledge about some things. Okay. So... Harry goes to him and he says, um, you know, I don't really know what happened to mummy, but I have suspicions she's not really dead. I mean, I don't know, but I think I'd feel a lot better if I could see all the pictures from the crime scene. If you got the pictures of the crime scene, because I want to see them, I think there's something there I could learn. Well, JLP's like, I'm, that's not for you to see. You don't need to see that. You don't need to look through that. They're very unsettling. And Harry is insistent. He has to. He'll never get past it if he doesn't see the actual pictures of her death. Well, he says that he's, he finally whittles the guy down. The guy brings him to the office, hands him a packet of pictures. He's like, look, these are some of them, but I'm not showing them all to you because you don't need to see all of them. They're just, you'll never be able to get the thought out of your head. And, and why should you have to live with that? So he's like, look, you, uh, here's some of them that you can see. It'll confirm your, it'll confirm what you need confirmed. So Hen Harry is shuffling through the, pi the, the pictures. He's really disturbed by all of them. Um, he's disturbed by all of the paparazzis that are around. Everybody's flashing pictures. And he says this as he's looking through the pictures and he's commenting on the night that his mother died. He says that there was the driver slumped over the wheel. He was blamed for he was blamed by many for the crash because there was allegedly alcohol in his blood and because he was dead and he couldn't answer. That's like, okay. <laughs> This guy was speeding down the tunnel at like 90 miles an hour. I mean, he was like bold as an owl. And you're trying to tell me that that had absolutely nothing to do with the fact that your mother is now dead? Get real. Okay, I know that you think that you can drive across Africa drinking whiskey and eating chocolate for two days straight and that there are no consequences to that behavior. But when people decide to drink and drive, there are consequences to that behavior. Okay, so you cannot just brush over the fact that this guy was blitzed and be like, I mean, they say he, that might have been a cause of the accident, but I mean, I don't know. We can't ask him. We can test his blood. That is the answer. Okay, so he's just torn up about the fact that all the pictures show all the paparazzis, you know, crowding around mummy, hunting her like a pack of wild dogs. Um, but what strikes him is that 
She has no visible injuries. She looks beautiful in death. She's there between the seats, but there's nothing wrong with her. So, I guess she's still alive. He says that, um, he said maybe the photos JLP held back were more definitive. Maybe they showed death in plainer terms, but I didn't consider that possibility too closely. I slammed the folder shut and said, she's hiding. She's definitely still hiding. Because the people at the hospital said she looked great, so that's the answer. Like, she's not dead. Okay, well, here we are. He's about to go off to military academy. He's about to go to boot camp, and he still thinks mommy's hiding. So I don't know if putting the, a gun in this man's hands is the best idea we can come up with. Boot camp starts May 2005. I guess his knee is healed. He goes, and it's a lot of talk about how it was really terrible, super difficult, a lot of running, a lot of terrible things, but everybody else was breaking into the strain of it, but they couldn't break him because he was already broken. So <laughs> good luck trying to make it worse. For him, it was fine. I mean, it was no picnic, but they weren't going to, he, like, he relished how hard it was. It, it felt good for it to be hard. He felt like, just like he did back in the Australian Outback, it was stripping him of all the unnecessaries in his life. And he was becoming more and more and more the, um, the, the essence of who he should be. And all the impurities were being drained away. And he just loved the, he calls them the color sergeants. So in America, we would have called them the drill sergeants, but there they call them the color sergeants. Those screaming banshees were taking everything out of him that needed to be taken out of him. He just, he idolized them for that. Um... And then, you know, he goes on a lot of asides. He makes a lot of sort of um, philosophical comments about the military, which I think he would have been better left not saying. I just don't think he knows what he's talking about. Um, I'm not saying that it just doesn't come off as very gen genuine when you know that he was there, but it was play for him because he was never going to ever be in any actual real danger. But he wants to play big man on campus. You know, here he is. He's just like one of the other guys, but you're not like one of the other guys. Those other guys are putting their life on the line for pennies. I mean, they're laying their life down for their country and they are really laying their life down. You are playing like you're doing that. You get a spot next to the, you get a spot next to some of the greatest men on earth and you get to play like you're one of them. But your life was never in jeopardy. It couldn't be. And so, I don't know, it's just hard for me to hear him talk about it because it just feels like you aren't one of them. He says that the exercises that they did were all supposed to be about war, but to him, they were about death. Okay, is there, it's a little bit of semantics there, isn't it? Isn't war death? I mean, it's not like you just sussed out a real detail that none of the rest of us have figured out. He says the, the whole motif of the army training was death. How to avoid it, but also how to face it head on. Okay, well, how astute of you for figuring that out. Um, and then he says that, of course, because it's all about death, they had to go stand on the graves of some of the fallen and, and read a poem. And he says that they'd read a, read a poem called For the Fallen and that the poem predated the ghastly wards of the 20th century, so it still had a trace of innocence. And I just want to say, say to him this. Okay. How much, really, how much military history do you know if you think that before the 20th century, war was some, somehow innocent? Have you studied anything? Have you studied any war? I mean, I don't expect him to know anything about the Civil War. Why should he? That's an American war. All you have to do is read one page about the, about the Battle of Gettysburg and you'll realize that there was no innocence to war, that there never has been. I know what he's trying to get at, but it just he's just making these points and he's just saying these things that I'm like, you're just talking out of your butt. Like, what are you even saying right now to me? The innocence of war before the 20th century. Okay, how romantic. It's just romanticizing all sorts of things. And, and then he says this. And this too, I just thought, you want to... He's always talking about how he's not much of an intellectual, how he doesn't like to read or anything. But then he throws in these little asides. He says things constantly these little asides that are aimed at making you take note of his intelligence. Like he's just kind of casually thrown in there, just real cash. And he says that um, 
It was striking how much of our earliest training was intercut, leavened with poetry. The glory of dying, the beauty of dying, the necessity of dying. These concepts were pounded into our heads along with the skills to avoid dying. Sometimes it was explicit, but sometimes it was right in our faces. When we were herded into the chapel, we'd look up and see etched in stone, dolce et decorum est pro patria mori. Sweet and fitting it is to die for one's country. Words first written, now this is what I'm talking about. Listen carefully, friends. Words first written by an ancient Roman, an exile, and then repurposed by a young British soldier who died for his country. Repurposed ironically, but no one told us that. They certainly weren't etched ironically into that stone. And then in the next paragraph, he goes on to talk about how much he hated the long hours when he had to sit in the hard chairs at Faraday Hall and Churchill Hall and read books and memorize dates and analyze famous battles and write essays on the most esoteric concepts of military strategy. And he says that these are the real trials for him at Sandhurst. Okay, well, you can imagine that that's true. But this whole little aside about the Latin words that were etched over the chapel, that they'd been repurposed by a... Um, they had been repurposed almost sarcastically by another British soldier. Like he throws that in at us just to be like, I know some stuff, <laughs> not that dumb. But it, but then you just go on to tell me that, but I'm like, not really that smart. It's like, what game are you trying to play at? Like, what character are you playing here? You know, the casually smart guy that, you know, you would never suspect because he never seems like he is, but then he'll say something with blinding brilliance. I don't know. I Maybe I'm just being nitpicky, probably I am, but you know, he goes on and on and on and on about how it was in the training and you know, the bayonet training when they'd all have to run at these sandbags shaped like people and stab them and stab them and stab them while they listen to some pounding music and scream and scream, kill, kill, kill. And even when the music was off, there'd still be people stabbing and stabbing and stabbing and screaming, kill, kill, kill. And you know, then they'd all laugh like they hadn't just seen somebody lose their mind. But it's scary. Um, Okay, now, if you thought the bolt going through his knee was disgusting, hold on, friends, because it's about to get a lot worse. At one point, they had to go on this long ruck march. Okay, well, who wouldn't? I mean, of course, we suspect that's what he's going to be doing. That's what they do. Um, and it was terribly wet and sopping wet, driving rain. They were marching, 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 big packs on their backs. At one momentary stop. Okay, you guys. Um... One momentary stop, a checkpoint, I felt a burning in my foot. I sat on the ground, pulled off my right boot and sock, and the bottom of my foot peeled away. Ah, it's too disgusting for words. I just can't stand the thought of foot injuries. Trench foot. The soldier beside me shook his head. Oh, you can't go on. I was gutted. But I confess, I was also relieved. We don't doubt you were. So he slumped off. <laughs> Goodbye, lad. See you back at camp. And he gets into the ambulance, only too happy to be rid of this hard work. And then a color sergeant comes. Color Sergeant Spence comes to him. He said, could he have a word? And Harry hopped down out, limped over to a nearby tree. And he says to Harry, he says, Mr. Wales, you've got one last push. You've literally got six or eight miles left. That's all. I know, I know your fit. I know, I know your feet are shit, but I suggest you don't quit. I know you can do this. You know you can do this. Push on. You'll never forgive yourself if you don't. And he didn't say it in like a screaming voice, like just coming to him and saying, "Look, you can. Don't give up on this. You can do this." So he finishes. It's terrible. He tapes his feet. Um, he can't hardly walk for days after that, but he feels a lot of victory in having finish things off and you know of course he circles back and thanks that guy for showing him a side of himself that he did not know that he possessed okay um blah 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 more talk about how it was so hard for everybody at boot camp tell us something we don't know and then um it's time for graduation and he particularly enjoyed this because he had gone to sanders first because he did not have to go to university University was not in the cards for him. So when he graduated, he outranked William, who had just entered. So William had to salute him. Oh, well. How the spare has risen above the air. Dear diary day, if ever there was one. But it's like, okay, well, he saluted you, but he was forced. So don't go wearing that as a feather in your cap. But um, And then he talks about how he's looking forward to 
northern Iraq because that's what's in the cards for him coming up the pipe. That's where he's going to be. And he says that, he says, my unit would be relieving another unit, which had spent months doing advanced reconnaissance, dangerous work, constantly dodging roadside IEDs and snipers. In that same month, 10 British soldiers had been killed. And in the previous six months, 40. But not you, Harry. Okay. See, because you, you don't need to include yourself in that sacrifice. You won't ever face that sacrifice. You get to be alongside for the ride. And in some ways, I almost feel sorry for him because wouldn't it feel terrible to be along to see all that and know you could never sacrifice what they were sacrificing. That your privilege encapsulated you and put you in a cocoon. So that you you got you, you experienced the horror, but there was never the catharsis of knowing that your sacrifice was also could also be included in theirs. It seems almost worse to be there to witness it, but to have nothing to give in return to the to your comrade standing next to you that you could never sacrifice your life for them the way they were sacrificing their life for you i don't know maybe that's a little bit saying too much but he was really ready to get out of there quite frankly because um there was a spy in the ranks somebody in their surrounding vicinity somebody in their circle of people was feeding stories to the press like really specific stories he was he says he was really ready to get out of england because war death whatever had to be better than being in britain i mean how very over dramatic apparently somebody had leaked to the press that william had left him a voicemail pretending that he he was chelsea okay so and and then also that um he had asked jlp to help him on a sandhurst research project okay well neither one of those are scandalous stories so what if the press knows that william left you a funny voicemail and that you asked a very well-trained individual in your inner circle to help you figure something out about a research project. He didn't write the research project for you. No one was saying you cheated. You just were asking for help with it. Okay, well, big whoop. But he says that the question is, how could the papers have known such deeply private matters? Somebody's feeding things to the press. Somebody's saying something. And he says that at one point, they even started wondering if it was Marco. Like, that's how frantic they became in their pursuit of finding out who the spy was like they trusted no one didn't trust their bodyguards who they'd always seen as brothers didn't trust even marco their pr private secretary but somebody some evildoer was in their ranks and who could it be so he says and this is where we leave off on part one please put me on a battlefield where there are clear rules of engagement where there's some sense of honor well i don't know if he could find the sense of honor even if it slapped him across the face he deals so inexplicably and unbelievably treacherous in all of his dealings. Would he know honor? Would he know honor if it came knocking at his door and spit in his face? Who knows? Okay, so that is the end of part one. We have completed at least one third of this book. Have we made it? Are we still alive? Can we breathe after all of that horrible? And it's like sucks the oxygen right out of the room with his complaining, but all right. So that is the end of that. Our next segment will come to us on Thursday. Um, but I got to end this video, you guys. I am so cold. My hands are so red. <laughs> so I'm going to go inside where there's some heat and um, edit this video. And uh, I'll see you on Thursday. Bye.